Okay. Should I ask them if they would, if they would rather sit? Would they come if it's outside? Jim, but I definitely understand. I understand the yeah, the need for Zoom as well. So if there is Ratash in the future, I will also send the Nicole Road through Boar Panaha so that you'll all have them. In the meantime, I'm actually we are going to begin by understanding Tvila in Tanakh by starting with the Tvilot of Rosh Hashanah. And obviously, this is not only going to be significant as we approach the Machzor and as we approach our own Tvilot, but it's also going to shed light on how significant the appreciation of learning Tvila in context is. And the reason why I say that is really twofold. What we're going to be exploring in our Shirim is number one, different Tvilot that we have from Tanakh. And I don't just mean this Mori in which we explored by the Hashem together two years ago, but rather, I mean, uh, to understand the development of Tvila, the context of Tvila, very often the halachot of Tvila as they appear first in Tanakh. That's going to be number one. Number two, whenever we don't have, or in order to break this up a little, then in addition to those Tvila, we're also actually going to be exploring the nature of Tvila. One can even argue not just the myth of Tvila, but where do we find not just specific Tvila, but where do we find the ideas of Tvila in Tanakh? And I know that sounds a little esoteric, but the Ezra Hashem, as we continue throughout the year, we're going to see how particularly in Sefer Shemot and Sefer Dvarim, we see not only references, but sources as to how, to, how we're supposed to worship Hashem properly. But this week, and there's Rat Hashem next week, Mamash Erev Erev Rosh Hashanah, what we're going to be exploring is really the basis, one can even argue, for the Tfilot of Rosh Hashanah. Mm -hmm. So uh, I see Becky's already thinking that we're going to talk about Tfilot Hashanah today. So now that's next week. And now what we're going to see is that the Tzvilag Musaf is really based on the Tzvilag Chana, in addition to so many different halachot of our daily Tzvilag being based on Chana. So I'm going to wait for that for next week, and this way everyone can mentally and the Ezra Hashem also philosophically prepare through the Tzvilag. But we're going to explore, as I think, a less noted topic, and that is the Tzvilag of Aleinu. Now, many of you are supposed to say Aleinu, and yes, it's true, we say it on Rosh Hashanah, but why are we starting off the year with the tefillah that we say at the end of our tefillah every single day of the year? As a matter of fact, it's incorporated, as we see in the end, the Ramah says, to end every tefillah, just like we begin tefillah with tefillah l'david, which we're going to explore, we end tefillah with Alinu. So what is the significance specifically on Rosh Hashanah? And what we're going to see is that this is one of the most fundamental tefillah that Chazal actually speak about is very much linked to Tanakh. And we're going to see even in later sources, one particular story in Tanakh. So without further ado, we're going to start with the sources in the development of Alimu. And here's a very good example of how very often in our Shurim, I'm going to begin from a very technical perspective, talking about the development of the Tzvilam. And then comes the heart of the matter, which is now that we understand the development, let's go back to the Tvila and try to appreciate how the development actually attests to what the basic meaning in our Tvila. So let's get started with the source of Alinu. The earliest source is actually in a Yerushalmi, or I should even begin with the Mishnah Masach of Rosh Hashanah, the basic idea of, of what Rosh Hashanah is. This is in a Parak Aleph, Mishnah Bet of Masach of Rosh Hashanah, Berosh Hashanah. So even if you don't have all the sources now, by the end of the day, I'll actually send you all the sources so that you'll have them as good chazara. But what Rosh Hashanah is all about is we know it's a universal day. It's not just a day about Am Yisrael's relationship with Hashem. This is the day of Riyat Olam. God actually looks at, at everyone, considers the deeds of every person. Now, this is all of mankind. The Yerushalmi, both in Rosh Hashanah and Abu Dazara, talks about then what to be should we say in Rosh Hashanah that reflect this idea. 
Man Sagar Baruch Hashanah Nivrach Ha'olam, well, according to the opinion, which is actually that of Abba Lazar, that on Rosh Hashanah the world was created, Ditani and Rav actually established Rav Ditani, Bitkiyata Deve Rav. As a matter of fact, this actually appears in what's called the Tkiyot of Beit Rav. Rav, as we know, an Amora, the first generation of Amora in Menbabel, a contemporary of Shmuel, Rav was Rosh Hashim of Surah in Babylonia, and he established what became known as Tkiyata Debe Rav. Now, they're called the Tkiyot, but we know that the Tkiyot, we're going to learn from Hannah next week, accompany the, the Brachot of Musaf. So he established basically a Seder of mm -hmm. what to say together with the Tkiyot on Rosh Hashanah. Now this is- Tani, can you just explain me? Rosh Hashanah is Kaf Hei Elul, not Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah, uh, hmm. Rosh Hashanah is Briyat HaAdam. That's right. right. So I meant universal man, mankind. Oh, okay. Not necessarily nature, which began, you're right, on Kaf Hei, but the creation of universal man. So uh, we're going to talk about man and man's deeds. Now with this, the Ushami then talks about, Rav says there should be certain something that accompany the Tkiyot. For example, Zahayom Tkilat Maasacha Zicharon Yom Rishon and Aki Baruch Hashanah Nebra Olam. We mentioned Sukim that talk about this idea. Now, interestingly, in the Rishami, in also not just Abu Dzara, but in Rosh Hashanah also talks about the Tani Bitkiata Dirav Zayam Tchilat Masacha Zikarom Yom Rishon Kichol Ki Yisrael Hu Mishpat Leloke Yaakov Vial Hamedinot Bo Yomar Is a Lacherav Is a Lashalom Is a Larav Is a Lasova Uvrit Zo Yipakidu Laskivan Luchayim Ulamavet. Now let me just ask you: Do any of these psukim sound familiar? Betach. Excellent. That was right. From what? And these are the psukim that with which we begin, some of which actually right? This is what we talk about, which means that Rav basically created, if one thinks about it, the beginnings of what we have today in our Sidur. Now, what's interesting is that it could very well be then that these ideas, right? Rav is expressing ideas that we should say. Some even want to attribute them the uh, source of Aleinu, the source of Aleinu, even, even to that, right? Basically, to tell us, as, uh, this is uh, the first source that we have to the fact that Psukim, maybe it would be easier, just, the fact that Psukim are going to be uh, accompanying the uh, the reciting of uh, Malkiot Zechorot and Shofarot. The first time that we actually find the Psukim of Alinu, which tells us that there must have been an earlier source for this, is in the Siddur of Rab Amram Gaon. So we're talking about, again, the 800s, which is very early. This is the first actual collection when we talk about a Siddur, an arrangement of Tzbilot, that means that these Tzbilot were already in existence. And what did Rav Amram do? He basically compiled them. So sure enough, in the Siddur of Rav Gaon, we have a Nusach Malay of Alein Yishabayach. But where does it appear? It appears basically as part of Tzkiyata de Beirav. That's exactly what Bella mentioned. And the Pesukim that we're familiar with that we recite before Malchiot, Alinu appears, which you're supposed to say, yes, that's how it appears in our Machsor. What's amazing then is that Alinu, before it became a Tzbila that we say every day, was first and foremost a Tzbila of Rosh Hashanah. First and foremost, it was Malchiot. So now the question is, where do we get this idea? Sure enough, on the Yerushalmi that we spoke about, and the Karban Ha'eda talks about this is Musaf. It tells us even the order, <laughs> meaning Alena was going to be one of the basic, basic and compilations of Tzvilot that we recite early on. And Rahai Ga'on. And so here we're also speaking about the time period of the Ga'onim. He says again that in fact, this is a, a very early establishment. It's part of the Tkiyata de Beirav, the Tkiyata of Rav, the Ata Rav, the Chidushlon, Ubachain, 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 it's Kane Hilfata, the Loyatir. And he says, not only was it the Tkiyata of Rav, but Rav established, again, specifically these, and you're supposed to say these Tfilot. And if you don't say these Tfilot, Rav Haigon says, 
if there is a ta'ut, yesh lach siram uliosram. Basically, you get a punishment if you don't say them. So that was meant to scare you. That was just meant to show how important these three loads are, and clearly in, in our Rosh Hashanah Dami. What's interesting is that it seems that it was only after 1171, when there was a massacre of Jews in Ploy, and we're going to see this, and that on their way to being massacred, they sung the song of Alamu. Since then, we actually find that there are Sidurim that contain the Aleinu Nusaf in a regular everyday Sidur. In other words, it was a historical event that transformed Aleinu from a Rosh Hashanah Tzvila to a regular everyday Tzvila. But in order to understand that and to understand why the people reciting Aleinu on the way to their deaths, they have to go back to Aleinu. So, why not Shema? Am I not Shema? I was waiting for that. Excellent. So we're going to speak about that as well. Why not Shema? So uh, firstly, just to give you us all a sense of how it became incorporated and how the Rishonim in particular see the importance of Alenu. Before we go back to explore Alenu, we find, for example, the Ropeach in Huwa, who lives in the 12th and 13th centuries. He says, It doesn't make a difference. And Rosh Hashanah every day, the Me'iri Ambrachot says, this is where we find that Alenu was basically added at the ends of Tvila. He says so that you don't immediately leave davening, but you stay a little longer. You should say, he says, Shir means more. Oh, Alenu the Shabbat. The question is why, right? Out of all the different Tvilot, what's the importance of Alenu the Shabbat? And the Shulchan Aruch doesn't mention Alenu the Shabbat, but the Ramad does. He says, Aharsim Hatvila. You should say Aleinu Meshabach. Rav Monk, I don't know how many of you have read The World of Prayer by Rav Monk. It used to be a typical bar bat mitzvah, Olam HaTvila, Betach Yishlachim, Be'ezashu Makom Babayit, and The World of Prayer. Again, that's where also he says, Eina Nuch Yecholim Lebatir B'Nizkeret Tvila Tino, Al Haba'at HaRayon HaNizkav Shekol HaNoshut Tatachit. He says, what's the idea behind Aleinu? The universal aspect of everyone coming to worship Hashem. It's all about everyone accepting the sovereignty of God in this world, which certainly is related to the theme of Rosh Hashanah. And he says, but we can't end our tefillah without mentioning this idea either. And more. There, that tells you why we're starting our year with Aleinu. Right? And all, out of all the tefillot, Aleinu is one of the most important, albeit later, of the tefillot to be incorporated daily. But the very fact that it started as a tefillah of Rosh Hashanah also underscores the importance of this tefillah. What's remarkable now is before we take a look at Aleinu, we find one other source that perhaps describes an even earlier testimony to Aleinu. Anyone know what I'm referring to? So far, we said that it's the time period of Rab, Rab and Shmuel, first generation of the Morat Yom and Babel. Okay, how we find during the time of David, Shlomo, Bayit Shemi, the idea of everyone celebrating Sukkot. So I would expect maybe even to start maybe to there, not, there. Not from so in the Tshuvot of the Gaonim, in Shari Tshuva, and, and uh, similarly in the Sefer Kolbo, it's based on the Orchot Chaim, he mentions, you'll know already by this time, and it's already been established that we say, and in Pirkei Darbi Eliezer, it says, That's why you're supposed to say it's standing, because it's so important. And the gematria of the word Aleinu was also Mu'umar. Vishamati. He says, and I also have this tradition that I heard, she Yehoshua tikano b'sha'a shekava shiricho v'chatam bo shem katnuto l'mafreya that Yehoshua composed Aleinu. So we're going to explore that in just a moment. And you see how just like in medieval Paitanim, the the Paitan placed his, his name within the piyut. Right, very often. So too, if you look at Aleinu Limafreya, you look at the various psukim, Aleinu Ayin, 
אין עלינו לשבח לאדון הכל, לתת גדולה ליותר בראשית. נקסט פסוק, שלא עשינו כגויי הרצות, שם, נקסט פסוק, ואנחנו קוראים נקסט פסוק, אנא, הוא אלוקינו, what does that spell? הושעיה. Beautiful, right? So uh, if I go backwards, right, and very often we have this, in a pew team, and therefore you'll also find that Yoshua is actually the author of Alinu. Now we find the Chazal very often will speak about this. Moshe Rabbeinu composed the first bracha, bracha tamazon. Yoshua Benon composed the second bracha, bracha tamazon. Basically, again, what this means is that the ideas were already present then. But what's interesting is that Rav Haigo, who we already brought up, again, he addresses, again, there's a tshuva where he talks about whether or not you should say Alinu, even if you're in Chutz Laretz. And he says, why would you even have a question? Because Yehoshua Shua said it when he came into Eretz Yisrael. So it seems that, that it's a tzvila that should be directly linked to, yeah. to Toshabe Eretz Yisrael. He says, but no, because the only tzvilot that we say specifically in Eretz Yisrael are the tzvilot that are linked to the Beit HaMikdash. Those tzvilot you're forbidden to say outside of Eretz Yisrael, just like we say in a Mizmor. But because Yehoshua composed it before the building of the Beit HaMikdash, you can still say it outside of Eretz Yisrael, right? This is fascinating. And then he says, and also it's a service that's verbal, it's not an action, it's not actually linked to the Beit HaMikdash, so, and that's why in the Beit HaMikdash, they used to say, Ritze Yishe Yisrael, and we still say this outside, but basically, he says, it was composed by Yeshua ben Nun. And sure enough, again, the Baal Iyun Spila brings this, and he says, Hama'ayin b'chol ha'tshuva, we'll see that it's actually not Rav Ha'ga'on. Again, the earliest source that we have then is to say it's Rav Ha'ga'on, and Rav Ha'ga'on says that Yeshua authored it, and the Kolbo quotes it later as well, as we saw, so Yeshua is the author. What's interesting is we're going to see that there are various reasons to say that it was later, that it was during the time of Rab, or maybe during the time of the early Gaonim. As we said, again, if you look this up on Wikipedia, it will say, say that the original version was actually Balashon Yachid, Alay Lishabach Ladon Hakol, and it was part of Masa Merkava, which is part of the writings of the, of the Mekubalim. So what's this idea of saying that it goes back to the time of Yehoshua? And Rav Elimank again in Olam HaTzvila beautifully says, Lo min ham nimna sha'amnan mutza'am shal harayonot ha-yisudiyim kfar bizman shal Yehoshua benon. You have to understand, go back to Tanakh, go back to the time period of Yehoshua benon, and you'll understand that the concepts that are mentioned in Aleinu are directly related to the challenges of Yehoshua as he enters the land upon his imminent conquest of Yom Yichol. Right? Fascinating. The Tzkufat, he says, but during the time of the Amorahim, that's when it, the Nisach came about. Uh, well, I definitely encourage everyone to take a look at where the page that I gave you is from as well, which you'll see on the link in everyone now later on, that Dr. Benny Gesundheit wrote a, or compiled a whole um, I would say compilation of Makoro, but he also wrote in a, uh, um, an article in Haaretz a few years ago where he spoke about the different opinions as to when Alina was authored, whether it was during the time period of the Amoraim, whether it was a polemic, whether it was during the time of the Beit HaMikdash, whether it was uh, based on Brachot, maybe even during the time of Akirat Avodazara, and, and even during the time of Yehoshua ben Nun, which uh, he says also, Rabbi Yaakov ben Asher says, however, that it was a nusachat of sifru tahechalot and the merkava of chachmei hakabala. So uh, that it goes uh, to the time period really of sifru tahechalot. And the tour says this explicitly that again, the, uh, the idea of saying kisei kabod, this is sifru tahechalot. And sure enough, there's, there are plenty of reasons to say that even Rav Haigaon didn't write that tshuva, that it's not an accurate source. Some explain that maybe because we have no evidence that there really is a community that he's writing to, and his name is signed wrong, that there are inconsistencies in the letter. And therefore the question is, and why 
do we still quote this? Why attribute it to Yahushua? And we said that this may be, again, number one, to say that this is a basic idea, that it wasn't just a polemic. These are basic, basic ideas fundamental to Yahadut, definitely linked to concepts of Rosh Hashanah, not just anti-Christian, which we're going to see is going to be very important historically to keep in mind. And, and at the same time, we know that by ascribing difference below to Tanakh, as we're going to learn throughout the year, then it certainly elevates that to be loud and makes that to be loud even more important. So Daddy, when you talk that, about Olenu, when you just did the Rosh Tevot, you didn't mention the Pasuk, Sehemi Shachavim Hevel Varik, and I remember when I was growing up, I never said that. I never said it. So we're going to talk no, about I even that. saw it, it was not part of the of, of the Sidur. I remember the first time I heard about it was in Katmos Shava. And I couldn't <laughs> where it came from. Wow. Wow. So uh, we're going to see that it comes from uh, an anti-Semitic uh, libel, basically, in the 1700s. And that's when it was censored out. So we're going to take a look at that. I'm oh. glad you're mentioning this because we're going to talk about the development of tefillah. And uh, but what's interesting is that in addition uh, to uh, to this, and we see that and the uh, idea of reciting it daily, we said came after 1171, and it was only when uh, they sang this that it becomes becomes incorporated in our sidur. Already tells us it has something to do with kabbalat omachut shamayim, right? Something like shema. And in the Perushe Sidur of the Rokeach, he has the actual Nusach. And he says also that that someone should pay attention to this because it's like Shir Hashirim. Even though he already explained, we explained that Rav Haigaon, who lived about 300 years before him, may not have really been. And it may not be an accurate source. Nonetheless, it's quoted by Rishonim. And because he's such an anav, he, uh, he doesn't write his name, but rather hints to it in Alinu Lishabach Lazen Kakos. Not only is Yahushua's name hinted to here. But we also see, again, there's another connection. I'm just trying to remember where it is that talks about, again, the first paragraph being attributed to, again, to Yahushua. And the second paragraph, Aleinu Lishabach, let's not call the second paragraph of al Kave. What's the last letter of each one of those first words? Al Kane the first letter of each one of those words. Ayin Khafnun Achan. So we also have a tradition that Achan is the one who authored the second. Now, in order to understand these ideas, whether we said they're actually historically correct in the actual Nasakh, or just as we found beautifully, the Rokeach explaining that it's the ideas that are fundamental. So we have to go back, as we always do then, to the story in Tanakh. So do you remember Yahushua, Perak Vav, they go out to fight their second war of Ai and they're not successful. And then Hashem says, because someone took from the spoils of the war. Who took from the spoils? This was their first war. This was supposed to be how they are going to set their eyes on not just the land of Israel, but what it means to come into Eretz Israel. And Hashem said, It's going to be declared You have to recognize that you're here in Eretz Israel. You're successful in your various military victories for one reason and one reason only. And why is that? Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants you here. And that's when, again, we hear that even if it wasn't just Achan, that Parshanim explained that Achan took, but no one else said anything, or that Am Yisrael, many of them, the Chazal tell us, but Yimalu, why is it in Lashon Rabin? Because they all thought about taking something. In other words, this idea of God being the victor over all of our enemies, it wasn't completely internalized by Am Yisrael. And the ma'al then, mi'ila, taking something that should be sanctified to Hashem and using it, using it for our own purposes, Yoshua, as we see, cries in front of the Aaron, and Hashem tells him it's because Am Yisrael basically have overridden my covenant, they've overridden the Brit, and uh, the only way to do this is basically get rid of the person who uh, 
who took from the Ma'al until then you won't be able, who took from the Khairim until then you won't be able to be successful against your enemies. Sure enough, we hear of a whole story. There's a goral, there is a lottery, and who's the one who's convicted by Yakodat Mishbachat Hazarhi? And then it's uh, it's found to be Achan ben Karmi ben Zabdi ben Zarach Lamate Yehuda. Yoshua says, say Bidoy. Right? This is one of the first instances of Bidoy that we have. Tell me what you did wrong. Because of, because of Asiti. I've sinned to Hashem. He literally goes into details. I saw a firm, I saw a, a saddle, that and I hid it in my tent. They're displayed before Hashem, and Yoshua then takes Acham ben Zerach, ben Takesef, ben Zadarik, Lishon Azahar, ben Bana, ben Benotab, and his sons and his daughters, and Shalron, Chamaro, Tzono, Alo, ben Kol Hashalo, ben Chol Yisrael, Limo, ben Yolu, Otam, Imakachor. And he goes to one of the valleys right outside of the area of Yericho, and it's called the valley of brooding, right? Like Akira. And he says, What have you done as a result? God is uprooting you. What does that mean? Just like on Yom Kippurim, we perform skila, it means they threw him off a cliff. And uh, Finished, and his sons and his daughters basically stoning him. That's stoning to death. And therefore, the question is which ideas do we extrapolate potentially from the story of Yehoshua that we find in Alino? Well, one idea one can argue is that if the Tkiato of Rav. The whole Musaf of Rosh Hashanah is linked to Achan. One can find a connection, namely that in Perak Vav, we already see that when they went ahead and uh, they they and had uh, already conquered Yericho, it was accompanied by the sound of a shofar, if you remember. So uh, maybe the shofar, the shofar reminds you of Yericho, the shofar reminds you of war, the shofar reminds you of Achan. And the sin of Achan and the vidui of Achan. So that's one idea. Yeah, not the, uh, the shofar scene. Another is that it reminds us of the whole Yericho scene. Rachav says, Hashem is the only God. This is an idea that we see in Aleinu. The Chida says that, yes, Yoshua comes from Yosef, who's called the Shor. Aleinu Lishabeach has the gematria of Shor. Also, Yehoshua conquered Yericho, circled it seven times, and he mentioned the, the 42 letter name of Hashem, whose initials are Ana Bakoach Adulat Yemahat Lachat Hatir Tzirura, which is the Gematria of Alinu Lishabach, because he did the miracle for us with a 42 letter name. Rabbi Yaakov Emden Shir mentions uh, the idea of, uh, again, of Achan, as we said, Al Kinekave. So we have that reference, the uh, idea of uh, Kiddush Hashem uh, that we're going to get to as well. Again, uh, that these are ideas that we see in the story of uh, in Aleinu. So now let's take a look. Right now we're going to examine Aleinu, and it's going to become very, very clear why one could say that the ideas come from the time of Yehoshua, and why we say this as Malchiot. Everyone ready? This is really the Karavar Shi'ur. Aleinu l'shabech l'adon hakol. Notice that everything is mentioned in third berabim, and notice that it's all in third person. And we talk about Hashem being the one who created the world. And even though he created everyone, he made us different. And Becky, this pasuk is part of the original. But all the other nations don't get it, right? They worship other gods. And 
כן, שהוא נוטה שמיים ביוסד ארץ, המושב יקרוב בשמיים ממעלה, שכינה תוזו בגבי מרמים, הוא אלוקינו אין עוד, אמת מלכינו, אפס זוהתו, ככתוב בתורתו, וידעת היום משאבות אל לבדך, כי השם הוא אלוקים בשמיים ממעל ועל הארץ מתחת אין עוד. And then we go on, ועל כן נקבל לך השם אלוקינו. In short, if you look at Alinu, the Mila Mancha, the light motif of Alinu is the word Malchut. Now we understand why this is the perfect, these are the perfect Psukim to introduce Malchut. However, if you look at these two different sections, you see something remarkable. The first section talks about Shamayim three times and Aret three times. In other words, it talks about basically in the particular relationship that we here by Aretz have with Hashem, Hashem who is transcendent, and the relationship that we have here on earth. And that therefore everything is, again, basically, again, in these nine sukim, Hashem Holokim, again, everything is in the third person. Take a look at Alkina Kabelcha. We still have the continuation of Malchut, again, together with Vayashem Lamelech Kol Aretz mentioned at the very end. But this time it's in second person. This time we talk about now that we recognize God is our king, we have a responsibility to make God universal. We have a responsibility to share this so that one day and all of the nations will be able to recognize God. And therefore it's not just about Shemayim and Aretz. Shemayim doesn't appear here. It's only about the Aretz, God's manifestation to all the different nations on earth. And therefore, if you look also at the Makarot of Tzvilat Dalinu, you see so many of these ideas are based on Sukim, in fact, to Al Tanakh, as we already mentioned, Gena in not just Yehoshua, but Yishtayahu, numerous eschatological Sukim over here, Gen, but definitely Yehoshua as well, as Rachav is the one to say, there's no God like the God, again, of Am Yisrael. So here we have beautiful ideas that definitely relate to and not just to Yoshua, but really they do relate to Achan. What does Achan say? It's not just about recognizing the transcendence of God, that God is great, that's Yoshua. It's about recognizing that every single individual, even the sinners, even the ones who worship Abu Dazara, even the ones who take Ma'al from Yericho, they should recognize God. And that's basically the essence of Aleinu taking us from the universalistic to the particularistic, right? A beautiful idea here. Now, now we get to the actual story of what happens in 1171. So this is where, and we see number one, the idea, I'm going to just read the story of what happened. There was actually a, again, it begins with, and a, here we go. It begins with the story of Kiddush Hashem in the year 1171, where in France and Blois, there was the first blood libel, right? Wherein there was a German officer, a Christian officer, a Christian servant who was taking his, his master's horses to have water to drink. And that the, there was a Jew at, there at the well at the same time. And the horse got scared of, and that's something that the, the Jew was wearing. And all of a sudden the horse retreated and there was a big splash in the water and the horse refused to drink from the water. So this German servant came, this Christian servant came back to his master and said, why didn't the horse drink? The Jew so threw a Christian child into, into the water. And they said, well, I don't know. That's like a far-fetched testimony. They said, no, no. They brought the serpent. They created like the witch trials, a whole ceremony. If his words are true, then he's going to float. And sure enough, all the Christian bishops, they arranged that he would float in the water. And right away, they said, okay, let's, let's you know, still the, uh, the king wanted to investigate a little. And the priest said, no, don't investigate. We have to punish them right away. And sure enough, the city of Bloy was all massacred. They took men, women, children, and as they're basically being led to their death, they, they recite a lino. Right? And this is recorded. And, uh, and this is a really fascinating that as the wicked rulers command, the Jews were taken, put into a wooden house around which they were placed thorn bushes and sticks. They were led, they were told, save your lives, leave your religion and turn fast, but they refused. And it was reported that the flames were mounted high and the martyrs began to sing a melody that began softly but ended in a full voice. And the Christian people asked, what kind of song is this? We've never heard this. And uh, they said, this is uh, a convent upon us. Now what's amazing about this is that they don't just go to death. 
they probably also said Shema Yisrael. Aleinu L'Shabeach is really a beautiful song of tolerance for the Goyim. In other words, one day they're going to recognize you. They're, they're mistaken now. But one day they're going to come to this recognition, Hashem. And of their free will, basically, the people started observing a day of mourning. However, this is fascinating. This is what Becky was mentioning. In the 1700s, there was a German anti-Semite named Johann Andras Essenmanger, who was very upset that his closest friends at age 20 converted to Judaism. So he devoted the next 20 years of his life to study Judaism. Isn't that amazing? And then he came back and basically said, well, Judaism is anti-Christian. And what was his proof? Some claim that this was connected even to the fact that Jews would spit when they spoke about this. And he had this whole idea that Aleinu, that the uh, the gamat, that how do you read it as well? Barik, Barik is Yeshu, right? And it said they're speaking against Christianity. So the king censored this pasuk, and it basically remained censored. And as Becky was saying, for for many years, again, until finally, again, the Maharil, Rabbi Yoshua Maharil Leibdiskin urged the reintroduction, which Baruch Hashem is now back in its original form. Now, again, what's the original form? The original form, as we said, is really first found in the Siddur of Aram and Gon. Nonetheless, the ideas behind Aleinu take us throughout history. And once we see that story of Loy, what happens after that, the Rishonim say, let's incorporate it in our everyday tefillah. Just like Shema Yisrael, what does it represent? It represents Mesirut Nefesh. It represents the ideals of eschatology. The same Malchut and Mesirut Nefesh that we recite on Rosh Hashanah, what comes incorporated every single day. Some would say that Rabbi Alexander Ziskin in his Sefer, Yisod Shor Shavodah, he talks about how you have to say this, Gen Korim Mushachabim Besimcha, how this is, these are basic ideas fundamental to Judaism. The Rokeach also talks about that Aleinu Shabbach is like Shir Hashirim. You should have Ema, Nira, and Retet, and Zaya when you hear this, because HaKadosh Baruch Hu waits for the entire nation to say this together. Again, the Seder Hayom writes that Aleinu Shabbach has to be said with a Kavanag Dula, because it talks about the oneness of God, it's Kabbalat O Machut Shamayim. And basically, as we take a look at the historical developments, we're able to appreciate what we say every single day, but all the more so have this is really a synopsis of what Malchiot is all about. And it, the uh, basic idea is over here that we see, and sure enough, if you compare, Aleinu Shabbat the al Kabe, they both have nine psukim. Aleinu Shabbat talks about the present. al Kain talks about the future. Aleinu talks about we're special. Again, Kakatupa Torah To. But then we turn to the other nations, and it talks about, okay, Kakatupa Torah Tacha, we're in the second. The, uh, the second person. In Aleinu L'Shabach, we quote more from Devar and Perek Dalit. In Alkina Kabe, we talk about Shmuel, Perek Tegbab, Yitzhia Mitzrayim, how Hashem created us as a special nation who is supposed to have an effect on others. Anachnu Korim versus Lachat Tichra in the future. God is Malach Malchei Hamlachim. In the future, Yikabu Fulam O Machutacha, Moshav Yikaro, Lachot Shemcha Yikar Yiteno, Shechina Tuzo, Gen Betiferet Uzecha. We know today, but in the future, we do, we do, and therefore, we began with Aleinu L'Shabeach, not Dona Kol, one day, Timloch Alehem. The other nations are going to recognize this as well. And that's part of the idea of linking it to Yoshua, linking it to stories in Tanakh, that we understand the basic ideas behind it when we recite the Kabbalat on Mochut Shamayim. One of the basic ideas as well is that not just Yoshua, but Hoshea, who we read, the uh, Shabbat between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, Shabbat Shubat, Hoshea says one day Hashem is going to go to the Midbar and appease on Yisrael and basically transform Eme Achor into Petach Tikva. And we hope that the transition of Aleinu L'Shabea to al Kaveh will in fact bring about Bahaya Bayamahu Yeh Hashem Echad Ushmo Echad. And uh, this is a tremendous then expression in our daily tefillot of what uh, Malchut Hashem is all about, and by reciting it, thereby our Kabbalat or Malchut Shemayim. So here's one example of how stories in Tanakh basically uh, illuminate and elucidate and animate and uh, create tremendous tocha and the content for our to be loved. Shavuot Tov. Tov. And it'll be, it will be more systematic, and you'll have in the plural already by the session of Isha Bath. That's going to be my my teacher and my friend. Amen. Amen.